call to order. Give it a good bang. <laughs> uh, welcome everyone to August 20th uh, Board of Ed meeting. It's uh, first time in a while we've, uh, we've been in person. Um, before we start, uh, so we, uh, we're not able to have a, uh, an in-person public audience today because of uh, the executive orders uh, limiting the number of people that we can have and with uh, some technology concerns we wanted to make sure that we were streaming live and uh, that was uh, we've got uh, we had a call out for um, people to submit some statements which we'll read we have one so far and uh, before we even do that I just want to uh, I want to thank uh, Matt and his team uh, for all the work uh, this has been a tremendously busy summer, as everybody knows. A lot of changes, a lot of things to learn, and I uh, want to thank, uh, thank these guys for all the work that they've done. And also want to thank people uh, in the public for, for all the messages, the emails, the communication that, uh, that they've sent. Uh, everything, everything gets read. We learn from, from all, the, all the messages and uh, you know, keep them coming, especially when uh, we can't have people come to the meetings. It's important that uh, the communication comes to us so we can know what people are thinking. So, so thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to go to public audience, and Jen is going to read uh, one, uh, one item that we had submitted. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it states, on August 19, 2020, 40 Simsbury families sent a letter to Superintendent Curtis, Assistant Superintendent Murray, Neil Sullivan, the Board of Education, the Board of Selectmen, Representative Hampton, Senator Whitcos, the Farmington Valley Health Department, Governor Lamont, and Commissioner Cardona. These comments summarize this letter. The signatories on this letter are in support of a full-time return to school for students. The students in Simsbury need to be the highest priority. A full return is warranted due to the established low infection, hospitalization, and death rates in Connecticut for the past two months. These rates are especially low in children. Students need to be in school to prevent depression, suicide, and child abuse to make sure they have access to education and meals to prevent students from falling behind and to maintain structure. The proposed hybrid model is the riskiest option because children with working parents may be in childcare situations outside of the cohort on home days, which will introduce additional germs into the school. A full return is supported at the state level by the governor and commissioner of education at the federal level and by experts such as the American Academy of Pediatrics and by Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Fauci endorsed a full return to school for students in Connecticut on August 3rd, 2020. Governor Lamont said last week that if Connecticut can't be reopened, I don't know which state can. Simsbury has adequate resources and space to allow students to fully return to school while ensuring adherence to social distancing guidelines and state health mandates. Countless summer programs and camps were able to successfully open this summer in our area with the appropriate health protocols in place. And they had extremely limited cases of COVID-19 amongst children and staff. Daycares in our area have been open since March. These examples demonstrate that schools can safely open full time for all students with limited risk. If the hybrid model must be maintained longer than anticipated in Simsbury, we request that families be given the option to send their children to school full time in the same manner that families have been given the option to do full time remote learning. We also look forward to hearing from Superintendent Curtis and the Board of Education as soon as possible, or at the very least by the end of the first two weeks of school about a return date for grades seven through 12. We support a full return to school for these grades now, or at the very least by the end of September. These comments are supported by the following families. And I'm gonna do my best to say the family names. Um, and I apologize in advance if I mispronounce. Um, the Sternberg family, the Libros family, the Pug Glassy family, 
Trafficanti family, the Sudby family, the Brickley family, the Cummings family, the O'Brien, the Leet family, the Riviera family, the Ogle family, the Baroncelli family, the Berman family, the Chapman family, the Myers family, the Birch family, the LeFranc family, the McDonald family, the May family, the Knight family, the Sabin family, the DiMartino family, the Chung family, <clears throat> the Seam family, the Fletcher family, the Ingram family, the Gonslaw family, the Romeo Hope family, the Sword family, the Park family, the Pennell family, the Civitillo family, the Bryan family, the Lifthidis family, the Peterson family, the Vander Walker family, the Seymour family, the Kelly family, the Cal Callahan family, and Betty Kuproxy, MD. Thanks. Thank, Thank you for submitting that. Uh, move on to board and administrative communications. I'm going to go the other direction. This start with Brian. <laughs> Uh, Look at you switching it up. Nothing, yeah. <laughs> nothing tonight, Todd. Thanks. Hey, uh, just briefly, uh, we had a chance uh, to meet with the Board of Finance uh, earlier this week to discuss the um, the school master plan and really to, again, if you take it in context, because of the obvious, we, we really haven't spoken to them in f five months, I guess. Uh, so uh, the Jeff from Tecton gave a great presentation of our options, where we are, costs, and the Board of Finance members uh, had some very, um, uh, some just excellent questions uh, about how we made calculations, stuff like that. They asked for some additional uh, information for their modeling. Um, and so I thought the conversation went really well. I don't know if you have any other questions, but again, just th th thanks, great, thank you, thanks to the Board of Finance for giving us the time. And I know this is just one of the, you know, this will be the start of hopefully many conversations with them. Yeah, I, I would just add, I thought it was a great pivot point, right? Our, our board made the decision a mm -hmm. um, couple months ago now to look at what that first best option was, which was uh, to review either a new build or a renovation at Latimer coupled with the sixth grade wing. And I know that the Board of Finance has really uh, wanted the opportunity to get specifics, as, as you said, Jeff, on the dollars and start to weave that into modeling exercises with Amy. And I, th I thought it was a very productive conversation. Absolutely. I thought their questions were excellent and uh, look forward to picking it back up yeah. uh, once we have some more specifics and, and timelines on what that might look like. And Jeff, again, uh, with Tecton, does a wonderful job uh, in his organization and communication. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I just wanted to, one, say that I did online today talk to a few people about the no public audience. And I wanted to reiterate that what Todd has said that, you know, our hope is to have a public audience and we want people to send in their comments. And so hopefully the next meeting we can do that. And then also, I don't know if everybody has elementary kids still, but um, I was fortunate enough to be part of um, at Terrafield School, because my, my children would go in there. Um, they did a like questions and answers with the principal and I believe I don't I think all the elementary schools are doing that yeah. and it was super informative I think everybody on the planet is feeling stressed and anxious and there's so many unknowns right now that I think um, it was great that he took the time and that they all will take the time to to let us know what's going on so it's, great. it's interesting I think a lot of the questions even we are receiving now are as the time is coming very close to the opening. Yeah. Our building specific, you know, what yes. might this look like at Tootin or what might this look like at Henry James? So I think it's timely that they're doing that. I know they're also, Aaron's gonna, I think, update this, doing some videos and things like that, but. Um. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I, was, I was gonna mention when I talk about our next meeting, uh, the, the intent is that the next meeting will be in the high school with, with a bigger room, if we cool. can get the technology um, to stream it. Um, with with some public audience, so that that's 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 the hope, you know. That as you know, things stay the same and, and we get the, the the tech working. Very good. I'm I'm staying home like everyone else. <laughs> 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 I have nothing that's going on. We're, I'm good. Sue. Just point out that uh, the task force that I've been leading to 
help uh, on the logistics side of reopening meets for a check-in tomorrow before our teachers were at 1130 tomorrow um, we've probably met about eight times over the course of the spring and summer and we'll meet uh, again tomorrow the, before our teachers arrive uh, on Monday and uh, we're not going to quite wrap up as we reopen because there's more work to do for that group so uh, but a very important meeting tomorrow at 1130. Okay. That's a loud voice. <laughs> I so I just want to let you know that we welcomed new teachers this week, and I forgot to count, Neil, but how many did we have? Fourteen, but yeah. we've added a couple since then. So we had the wonderful opportunity to welcome them to Simsbury and talk about a variety of different things. Obviously our strategic plan, but also those guiding principles that are helping us in our reopening. Teacher collaboration, social-emotional learning, the equity statement. Um, we just had such a great opportunity. And then my favorite in talking with new teachers is around curriculum instruction and assessment. So all of it is real, really preview conversation, but energy, excitement, so it was really a nice way to spend time with our new teachers here at Simsbury. And then secondly, throughout the week, I've had the opportunity to work with our principals, assistant principals, directors, to really begin to talk about the communications that are ready to be sent out and really making sure that we're communicating what's happening, as Matt said, at each of our building levels, uh, making sure that we're defining what hybrid will look like at each grade level, all the way from kindergarten through the high school. They'll be talking about the arrival and dismissals. I happen to have the opportunity to work closely with Scott Baker and literally beautiful slides, pictures that show where the drop-off is and where students will be entering the building, uh, bus transportation, and then the schedules that will be up for our first week of school and the second week of school. We'll talk about it a little bit here uh, more tonight, but uh, there's going to be a wealth of information as they bring teachers through professional development, de professional development next week. And teachers also, there'll be something going out Wednesday or Thursday to t to, um, from teachers to parents. And then again on Friday, giving kids I, an idea of what they're going to do Monday through Friday of the first week of school. So lots of information will be coming out to parents, but it is school specific and it will be grade specific that will come from the teachers. Um, I think we should add in that um, we have two of our board members that are listening and not here. Uh, that's a good point. We have, uh, I'll repeat what Sharon, we have Sharon and yeah. Lydia Sharon on the phone. And, and Lydia Tadone are, are with us um, by phone because they couldn't make it today. Uh, Due to so. quarantine and things. Yes. And travel. I don't have anything to report. Do they have anything to they have anything? I don't know. Do they have anything to say? Sharon or Lydia, do either one of you want to share anything? Yeah. that you know we've been meeting with the uh, national school board association the correct and k board directors continuously again you know regarding the school openings not only um local district or state but across the country so okay. we'll continue onward with uh, with this thank you thank you sharon do you have anything this is sharon i know it'll be hard I'm, i don't have anything thank you okay Okay. Almost said it's nice to be back in person. Oh, it's nice it to is. see everybody. It's been a while. So. Okay. Yep. Okay. We'll move on to uh, recommended actions, and uh, first thing is uh, approval of the minutes for the July twenty first special meeting. Any? I make a motion. We accept the minutes from the July twenty first meeting. Okay. Any, any discussion? Nope. Second. All in favor? Aye. Oh, second. <laughs> you can't even see people's mouths moving. Right, you have right. to raise your hand to be second. Uh, hello. <laughs> okay. All in favor? Aye. Okay. That's approved. Um, now the approval of minutes for the July 28th special meeting. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes for the July 28th, 2020 special meeting. Second. Okay. Any, any comments? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed? Gotta ask for that. 
<laughs> okay, um, that's approved. And uh, third set of minutes, uh, the July 28th, 2020 meeting. I make a motion we approve the minutes of the July 28th meeting. I'll second it. Okay, Jen, any comments? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. The only comment is we worked all summer. It's very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Interesting year. July 21st, 28th, and 28th. That's yep. approved. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, next uh, we have uh, personnel. Yep. I will just point out since your July 28th meeting was primarily about the hiring of our new assistant principal at Susbury High School, Vanessa Messiah. You will be glad to know that her first day was Monday and she has um, settled in nicely during her first week, so Vanessa is already with us. Um, a couple of actions tonight, two um, resignations, uh, members of Sue Lemke's team in special education. Uh, Jennifer Clark is a special education teacher at Squadron Line. Uh, she has been hoping for an opportunity um, at a middle school level and found one, uh, one in another local school district um, and uh, resigned her position after seven years with us, effective August 7th. And then secondly, we're once again a victim of our success in developing people in that Heather Tannis, the department supervisor for special education at Henry James, who has been um, an outstanding uh, leader at that level and uh, a huge support to Sue Lemke, um, not surprisingly was scooped up as an assistant principal at Granby Middle School. So um, congratulations to Heather on her first full building level administrative job. Uh, she's not too far away in Granby and we'll certainly uh, stay in touch and maybe have an opportunity to bring her back someday. So um, the motion is there on uh, your exhibit. If someone could please uh, move that. Move that the Board of Education accept the resignations of Jennifer Clark, effective August 7th, 2020, and Heather Tannis, effective August 21st, 2020. Second. Second. Any discussions? Thank you guys. Uh, seven years. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, the other action is under policy 4260.3, uh, a guaranteed leave of absence. Um, the Human Resources Department has been working with um, a number of our teachers and staff members who um, have, a, have, ha have expressed a variety of concerns around um, the return to school and COVID-19. Bec Becky Rosenthal is one that expressed some concerns, though not directly related to herself. We went through the options that she had and Becky decided that the best option for her was to take a non-salaried guaranteed leave of absence for the school year. So um, that's what, uh, so this, this would be the guarantee of holding her job when she returns and she would have the choice to return for next school year and needs to let us know by a date in the spring that's escaping me now. It's like March 1st or something like that. So that, that's under your policy 4260.3. So that motion is also there. I'll move that the Board of Education approve a non-salary leave of absence for Rebecca Rosenthal for the period of August 24th, 2020 to June 30th, 2021 with a guaranteed position upon her return. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 I want to thank you for making sure that everyone has, we're trying to look forward and try and take care of everybody. We're working. And I appreciate the yeah. efforts. I'll, and I I'll give a shout out to Cindy Freelinger in my department too, who's working really hard as a partner with me on it. So. I appreciate that and I look forward to Mrs. Rosenthal coming back. All right, I have a gift to the Simsbury Public School, specifically to Henry James Memorial School. So keeping with the uh, Board of Ed policy 2311, any gift over $1,500 comes to the Board of Ed. It's certainly been uh, reviewed and the administration at Henry James is requesting that the Board of Education approve a gift to Henry James from its PTO for $8,900 to be used for purchasing 12 resin coated picnic tables so that that will increase the capacity for seating outside for outdoor lunches and for instruction. Great. That's great. Your timing's perfect. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. 
I will move that the proposed gift of $8,900 from the Henry James Memorial School PTO be approved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. That's really nice. Good needs over there. Yeah. Thank you to the PTO. Thank you. Okay. So that brings us to our next item, the information reports and the reopening plan update. Yes. So I will, uh, I'll certainly start that off this evening. We have an uh, agenda uh, to put up and really our intent tonight is to focus in on a couple things uh, with a little more depth. So with the start of school right around the corner and the conversation we had uh, several weeks ago about altering our calendar to try to set the stage so that teachers had a full week where they will be able to prep and adjust and then students had a full week of half days where they can start to adjust as we enter into the hybrid model. We wanted to really talk through those two things to give the board and the uh, folks at home and, and staff listening uh, opportunities to gain a better understanding of that. Uh, certainly another large topic that we are just kind of closing out and, and, and ready to uh, start to communicate with are those families that have selected the distance, uh, the temporary distance learning option. So Neil has worked very hard with the principals and the survey results. He's gonna share some of that information tonight. Uh, it's close to 20% of our student population, which I think is over 400 elementary students. So, um, you know, you think of really the size of a pretty large elementary school that uh, is gonna be taking their courses online. Uh, we will, Neil will talk through a little bit of that transition model uh, that uh, Aaron will talk about the hybrid model a little bit and Neil will talk about the transition model and the timeline that we communicated in public. Um, access and equity is one of the years, so she's got some good information to share with us as well this evening, so. Wanted to start this off by continuing to uh, ground our conversation in these guiding principles. When we initiated our work on the reopen plan, we identified these principles and we wanna check ourselves against these principles all the way through. So just a reminder to the board and everybody listening, certainly the health and safety of our staff and students are at the forefront of our planning and those are our mitigation strategies, right? Those are the cohorting, those are all the things we've talked about in terms of procedural things uh, as, we, as we welcome both staff and students back. Uh, Aaron talked about high quality instruction. We have three different lanes we've been responsible for planning. In school instruction, online instruction, and this hybrid model. So what, what does the development of that look like and how are we gonna continue to communicate that and refine that because that will evolve as we go, we, you know, we continue to say it's a fluid situation. I know that can frustrate uh, people as well, but it really is, and we need to continue to evolve and get better at each of these things as we work through. The social and emotional support of both our staff and students, they've been gone for a long time. They're gonna walk into buildings that look different, feel different, and we need to be there to support them. And as we said, uh, access and equity that, that Sue will be talking about. So this is, this is a slide I thought people would, would find interesting. I actually borrowed it from a, a colleague, Kate Carter, who's the superintendent in uh, South Windsor, uh, coming off of a presentation with her board. So we belong, I belong to an association called the Hartford uh, you know, Area Superintendents Association. Uh, they've done different surveys on, on opening plans and gathered data. So uh, the organization just pooled this data to say, how are people planning to start the year? Uh, some of this may have changed a little bit since we've checked, but I think it gives us a good snapshot. There are 35 districts in the Hartford area region. 27 of those districts, or about 80%, are starting to some degree with a K-12 hybrid um, schedule, similar to what we're doing. Uh, three districts, and I don't know all of, all of the, the districts here to recite to you, but three are a secondary hybrid only. I know that's something that Glastonbury uh, is engaged in. They're bringing their K-5 students back, but 612 is starting in a hybrid. And then five districts have reported um, that they are, are starting with full in-person instruction. So I think it gives a snapshot of the area of what's going on, how our plans may kind of coincide or fit, fit with those plans. This third slide is, a, is an interesting one, and I know that the, um, the letter that we, we read into the record tonight and the one I received was very thorough, very detailed, and very data-based. And one of the data markers um, that are out there now from the Department of Public Health 
to help support school districts as they make decisions um, is this chart right here. So I wanted to talk through it. We get an update on this on a weekly basis. I think it's extremely valuable information. And what the Department of Public Health has done has aligned data markers with the three lanes or the three models, all right? So just to walk you through it on the left would represent supporting in-class instruction, in-house instruction to the fullest extent possible. The middle or the orange would be the hybrid model. And then to the, uh, to the right would be distance learning. All right, and the, and the data marker, the primary data marker they use are new cases per 100,000 and it's like a seven day rolling average. So what I wanted to talk through is, yes, the reality, we are very fortunate in Connecticut and extremely fortunate in the Hartford County and the Farmington Valley and how our data uh, is shaping up and shakes out, which is why we feel comfortable moving kids back into our building. Um, you can see the state of Connecticut the, uh, last week, it, it's two cases per 100,000. Hartford County is even a little more favorable at 1.6. And then the Farmington Valley Health District, so that's a compilation of 10 towns, um, is, is under one. So the data marker that supports in-school instruction is less than 10. So we are in very good shape. 10 or over favors more of the hybrid approach, uh, are 10 through 25, and then you get over 25. Uh, that's when you're looking at potentially an all-distance um, model. Other things are infection rates. Other, you know, there are many variables that will lead to conversation going on, but this is starting to be a data marker that people are taking a, a, a very hard look at as they make decisions on what to do with their plan. Um, so I thought that would be very interesting to share. I would say on, you know, Her Aaron's gonna share some details a little bit on the hybrid model. You know, when we went to and made the decision to look at the hybrid model, as a transition to ease our approach back in. Um, I do feel good about the approach. I know the board feels good about the approach. I know we've defined uh, a staggered schedule, which Neil will talk about. The reality of that hybrid model, what it will allow us to do organizationally, is really adjust to the new environment. And I don't think we can understate that importance. I don't wanna over-dramatize that importance, but what people are walking back into is different from what they left. And I think we need to recognize that from the pickup to the drop off, to the flow of traffic in the buildings, uh, to how we eat lunch, how we use the restroom, everything's gonna feel and look a little bit different. And I think the benefit of having fewer bodies in front of teachers and having kids become accustomed to things in a short period of, a relatively short period of time will really set us up for long-term success. So that's at the spirit of what the hybrid is. Uh, and in all fairness, um, the well-articulated uh, position of, of those individuals, I have heard from many individuals that also have provided feedback that they think the, the schedule is a little too aggressive. So we do need to be aware that people hold multiple perspectives on this. I don't feel there's any exact right answer, but I feel pretty confident uh, that our plan will get our students back in in a successful way uh, in a relatively short period of time, focusing on our little ones, which was the goal because we do know that they, they struggled significantly in the spring when we did this work. So I just wanted to, to kind of round that out before I Thank you. transition to Aaron. All right, so what I wanna provide for you is an update of the, the kind of work we've been doing over the last few weeks, preparing to return our teachers to school on Monday the 24th. This happens to be an elementary example of what professional development will look like uh, at, um, at an elementary level, but I have to tell you it's very similar to the secondary, to both the Henry James and the high school, I actually use the same format. We use sticky notes, we move them around in order to decide what the week will look like for teachers. Monday is a re-entry day. Monday on the 24th is when we'll bring teachers back to school. They'll have a warm welcome as they begin and then move into conversations with principals, their administrators um, at their building and then give teachers some building time in their classrooms. Then you can see that the topics that we found very critical as we've been preparing over the last several months, clearly the health and safety. We need videos, we need to talk, and that's what Monday will be about with our teachers as they re-enter our buildings. But we also have to make sure we're providing videos for our students, and that is in the making um, as well. Technology, we have a number of um, our 
professionals, our teachers that have come forward and have put videos together. We also have teachers that will be doing live professional development to teachers. All of this also will be made available to parents and to students to build their capacity around uh, technology. So there's some direct instruction and then there's some choice because different people have different skills when it comes around um, to technology. Social emotional learning, critical component of our reentry for adults and for our students. So uh, under the direction of Sue Lemke and Nancy Forsberg, they've been working hard. Several uh, teachers have been working hard at designing professional development opportunities for um, our teachers for themselves, but also how they'll engage students in learning um, as they reenter schools after being out for several months. You can also see that there's time for teachers to get together, PLC time, department time, but I wanted to be clear that in our first week that we put a balance of professional development learning, but also classroom time for teachers to get their rooms together, to be able to welcome kids back uh, the following Monday. Um, the PLC time will certainly be talking about the curriculum, the instruction and assessment, getting uh, it prepared. Um, so this is what a tip that the week will look like um, as we go through the five days next week. Karen, tell us again PLCs. Just I'm sorry, professional make... learning communities for teachers. That's when our grade level teachers come together to talk about their uh, unit design development implementation and at the secondary level it's like our eighth grade math teachers or at the high school 10th grade english teachers that get together so they're they're talking common language and expectations learning expectations for students thank you so as we re-enter what i wanted to do is to really give you a sense of what this first week will look like and it will be an early release week where it's a half day for students Again, all of this information and the specific details is coming forward next week. It will be provided to families and to students as we go forward, as will their schedules at the secondary level and their team placement. All of that is going to be put forward next week. So when students arrive on the 31st, it will only be our kindergarten, our seventh graders, and our ninth graders that we're doing an orientation with them. Uh, new students also have blocks of time that they'll be visiting the schools that they'll be attending. Um, all other grades will have opportunities to either look remotely at videos that teachers have created. There's going to be a video that Neil and he can talk about it a little bit more, but he's going to put together a health and safety video as well that students will be watching on that Monday. When we get into Tuesday, Wednesday, it's our A group will enter and B group will be home but there will be an opportunity for students at the elementary level to be remotely logging in to their classroom to be with their teacher to meet the other kids in their classroom that will be available each day tuesday and wednesday and likewise on thursday and friday as the a kids are at home the b kids are in school and they will be able to log in and um, have some opportunity on those um, shortened days on the early release um, i think um, the K-6, the distance learning, I don't want to forget, the distance learning, they will kick off on Monday with time with their teachers, half days. Those assignments will be um, distributed next week as well. So they'll know who their classroom teacher is and those teachers will be having those students log in and they will be receiving their devices uh, next Friday on the 28th. Um, so that they'll be ready to log in with those teachers. I just ask you, Aaron, a, a yeah. basic question that that I know I was thinking about before, but I'm sure others are. So if you're in the A group, let's say in the first, you're, you're in school. Mm -hmm. If you're the B group, are you taking that class simultaneously? So there will or, be... Or is it kind of like the distance learning that we did in the, in the spring? So what we're, what we're expecting is that teachers are gonna give the kids a schedule mm -hmm. and they're gonna say at nine o'clock, everybody's gonna log in. So you're gonna have the kids in front of you as well as the other kids. At the secondary level, the, they're going to be logging into each one of their classes. Okay. So on that Tuesday, it'll be 
the I'm going to say the even days two four six eight right. and kids will be logging in but they will have direction from their classroom teachers of what time okay. that will be so they will be and likewise so secondary are logging in elementary will have short sessions mm -hmm. um, with their teachers so to log in and we will be distributing so that we were worried that the B students wouldn't have devices prior to Thursday so we're going to distribute those on Monday so more information will be coming out on that um, as well. So they'll have that opportunity, directions to log in, how do you make a username, all of those things are gonna be. We're in a little bit of a tight pinch right now because of the return of our devices was not as full as we wanted it. So we're working hard and getting those machines back so that we can distribute them back to students. Yeah, I just, I'm still a little mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. And at the elementary level. So for the first week, it's going to be a little less, obviously, yeah. because of the shortened day. But in a regular, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, they will be logging in the elementary students for three sessions for ELA, for math, and the third session would be either writing, science, or social studies. And they will have a schedule of what that will look like. And every grade level is going to be a little bit different because they're specials. Um, what we're doing at the elementary level with our specials is for the first 30 days, these particular grade levels are going to get PE, and this group's going to get art, and these groups are going to get um, music. So we're really trying to be as clear with less movement of teachers as they go from classroom to classroom. Yes. And I just wanted to, because this comes up a lot, and that yeah. Monday, yes. if you have a child other than K, 7, and 9, all other children will just be waiting, f not logging in at set times. They're just going to, it's really kind of just watch some videos. Dead. So I would suspect what's going to happen, those emails that I talked about, they're going to go out Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Okay. That will give them a schedule, and it will say, at nine o'clock i want you to log in because we're going to do a classroom meeting and they will be logging in the secondary students on that monday will probably be having quick visits with their teachers saying hi i'm mrs murray and i'm teaching you pre-calculus and this is what it's going to look like for the rest of the week okay um, but that was our point of wanting to make sure the b group had their machines by monday i know it's not going to be fully you know the best way in which to do it but and then on tuesday our our a group will be in school and they will get their machines and all the information in which to log on and i just had a quick question about that slide before you go on about the teachers um week the educational base yeah um are the teachers who are doing full-time distance learning are they coming into the building for those days? Are they getting any sort logging of training? Logging in. Every one of the PD okay. sessions, there will be a login opportunity for them in which to do it. Okay. And they will also have opportunities with um, the PLCs or the teacher collaboration with okay. their grade levels that they'll have opportunities to do. So their first week will be around professional development as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. During the during the first week, is there any kind of dry run? I mean, are we gonna have extra IT <laughs> folks available yeah. just in case? We're trying to make as everybody that's going to be available available. Um, we're, 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 we know already there's some things like chargers, for example, they're back ordered. Mm -hmm. So we've got one charger. So when a, a child takes a device home from the elementary school in their bag and their device and their charger, charge it at home and bring it back the next day with the charger because if it's not fully charged, it's the only charger we have right, right now. But those should be in shortly. But those are the kinds of things that we're trying to, to ensure that we have covered and that we will um, ensure that kids have the opportunity to participate. So um, can I ask yes. a question about the distance learning? Sure. 
Um, so you've got 400 kids, some of the elementary schools, so they're not going to be distance learning within their elementary school. They're going to be distance learning. If you're a kindergartner, you are going to be with all the other kindergartners distance learning. It doesn't matter what elementary school you're from. So yes and no. <laughs> got a whole section on that. We do. I'm sorry, then I'm yeah, just going to wait my turn. Yeah. yeah. So, Neil, I think we'll talk Happy about that. Happy to wait. So there are some groups that are a little above. A little just above. a question. Yeah, no, yep. good one. You get a but, lot. Yeah. Um, so that's K-6. Um, and I put um, the, the second week up here really to, to give you a sense. These are full days. These are full days. Buses will be running. Um, they will have had the opportunity, the A kids in school, the B at home, and the A at home, and the B at school. So the logins should hopefully be working much better. Um, and um, we do have webcams that we're putting out so that it's not just a computer, but the teachers will be able to be seen um, through that. And again, distance learning for those students will continue with their classroom teachers. That was that. So as we look at the hybrid model, it, you know, the, the, the notion of it is clearly to have 50% in school and 50% out of school at the, at the time. Um, we've done them through an alphabetical model um, to ensure that we, and it really has worked. It was fascinating. I think it was one student apart when we did this alphabetical, but we wanted to ensure that families had their kids on the same days. We wanted to, to make sure that happened. Um, so again, the things that we had talked about is that students will log into those educational blocks. The elementary students will say, and that's where structure and schedule is so important to kids and to families so that they'll know, and it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be, you know, like, I want you to log in at nine o'clock for math. And at 1030, we're going to do writing. And at one o'clock, we're going to do ELA if you're at home. And there may be other times that they'll ask kids to log in, but those are the three educational blocks that we're gonna be looking at. That's for K-6. And secondary students are gonna follow the course schedule and um, they'll be in for the, the instruction and then there'll be a variety of different ways in which kids will engage in learning. There may be a time where a teacher does a 10 to 15 minute introductory lesson and say, okay, those at home log off, I'm gonna work with you, but come back on in 15 minutes, or everybody comes on at this point and I'm gonna put you in breakout rooms because what we know about distance learning is that connection between teacher and student and student to student. So we're trying to reinforce that and make that available to kids as much as possible. And clearly the most you know, important point in bringing um, all of us back together again is really providing opportunities for social emotional learning. Those warm welcomes, opportunity, and Sue's gonna talk about it in a little bit and give more information on that. So I think uh, Neil's gonna jump in here. And I have one you, more question, oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. But week three, okay. <laughs> so you've got week one with Monday being initial and not in the schedule in week two, Labor Day. What happens week three when Monday's a full day of school? Well, we're gonna talk about that. It, Monday- I got am I asking a question? I'm sorry, I'll stop <laughs> asking That's okay. Questions. But Monday sorry. will be a remote <laughs> day. We'll talk about that. But there will be, what we wanted to do in the schedule is provide time for teacher collaboration, check-in time with students. I can tell you will be short sessions, and then professional development time. And so Neil's gonna talk, that's where he's gonna step in. Okay, and, great. And talk. When the A kids are home mm -hmm. um, on Thursday, Friday, yeah. say, and they're on their Chromebooks, yeah. the B kids are in school, yeah. the teacher's teaching, is the teacher going to have to have, like for English, for elementary school, are they going to have to have like everything on their Zoom or Google Meets, like on the laptop, and will the students at home see the, they'll see the teacher, because mm -hmm. we've all been on Zooms mm -hmm. once or twice mm -hmm. maybe in the mm -hmm. last six months. <laughs> <laughs> Are Zoom experts. Mm -hmm. Will they see their students and their fellow classmates? And stuff? How's that going to work? Do they have cameras in the room, or so, is it going to be through their laptops, or how are we, how are we handling it? So what it will be is a, a webcam that will be mainly focused on the front of the classroom, Perfect. on the classroom teacher. Um, but we're also, you know, we've had conversations like, you know, pair an A kid with a B kid so that when it's time to log in, you can make sure that person's on and things are, so we're trying to keep track and, and, and ensure because attendance, engagement, motivation, energy is so critical for our yeah. students as we bring them back. And for the teachers, how, what's the feedback? 
back then on the hybrid model for that. So I think Neil can talk a little bit more about that. He's had, you know, more conversations. Um, and again, I think it's a balance of as we look at it. But hopefully this has given you a little deeper understanding. And um, again, it's a flexible, fluid um, system. And we're going to work on improving the elements every day as we move forward. Thank you. That was great. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll... I'll <laughs> I, I will take a second to, I mean, I do think um, our teachers are, um, you know, recognizing the importance of getting kids back in person. The, the, the hybrid learning model with I'm teaching kids here and I'm teaching kids there has some trepidation for them. Um, at the elementary level, the, if the plan works that I'm going to talk about here, that we get back and the infection rates stay low it's it's a relatively short period of time that we would be in the hybrid at the elementary level and was strategically planned that way i certainly think at the secondary level um you know we've spoken with teachers that you know they just haven't experienced yet they're nervous about it it's not that people aren't ready to give it the college try but it it doesn't feel natural yet and that that i think is a fair way uh just like in march distance learning didn't feel natural and, and people started to get their rhythm with it so i think it's a it's a fair point and certainly one that we've been um talking with our our teachers about um uh you know especially at the secondary level where it's where it's going to last for a longer period of time the other one that i wanted to address before i go into my portion um uh, at, at another meeting i was in today somebody asked me to address that um wh why the tuesday wednesday and then thursday friday schedule we had shown a version of hybrid earlier in the summer where wednesday was the day and uh, it's for a couple of reasons like you can see that not only have we made the first monday an orientation day then it's labor day um, on September 29th, it's Yom Kippur, or September 28th is Yom Kippur, and then October 12th is Columbus Day. So in rapid uh, fashion, you have a whole bunch of Mondays that are not school days. And we wanted to maximize the days that kids were in school and ended up with this model of, of um, saying Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, Friday. It also provides consistency for people that had to be scheduling daycare uh, arrangements of what days of the week you needed arrangements. And then um, I, other people uh, in other districts have talked about the fact that you get one cohort out and Wednesday is a deep cleaning day. And that is a, a funny notion to me because we're gonna be cleaning these buildings every single day. Um, they're gonna be disinfected every day. Um, and I do want the board to, and the public to know that we are actually increasing, um, we're in the process right now of hiring three more custodians across the district. Um, so 120 more hours per week of um, cleaning manpower. In addition, we also will certainly plan on those Wednesday nights into Thursday that I'm sure that's a night that our head custodians, if there's some overtime necessary for guys to get to um, all the spaces, you know, we know it's going to it's going to take some overtime, and we really are happy to, um, and we have some good people ready to go who have been on our summer crew that we may be able to hire here mm -hmm. to jump in to um, take some of these full time positions that we've added to their union. So pretty pretty happy about that. Neil, I would add, sorry to jump in, but on, on Aaron's side, I know there was quite a bit of conversation while that model was evolving, that the Monday also allowed people to pull together the class community uh, in one place, set the learning expectations for the week, and kind of create that, that continuity moving forward. A little technical, I don't know. Go ahead. So uh, I'm, I'm going to speak to the response to our survey data that we put out um, starting on August 3rd, thought we would collect it. Um, by August 7th, little did we know that much of Simsbury would be without power for like five days and ended up uh, extending it out to August 11th, which put us a little bit behind the eight ball in terms of mm -hmm. chasing down data. But um, right after it closed, the next morning, our secretary started calling anybody who hadn't responded to the survey. And by the end of last week, we felt pretty good about where we were in terms of knowing who were the people coming in person and who were the distance learners? So the figure is right around 
but I could tell you it's just short of 20% at the elementary level. So a little bit higher, um, uh, that, that's about, it's just short of 400 kids at the elementary level um, for distance learning. At the middle school, it's uh, right at 100, I think it's 99 as of today, 99 kids out of about 600 in the middle school and 170 students at the high school out of about 1,300 students at the high school. So that gives you a little bit of a flavor of how that with, obviously at the end of the day, that comes out to 18 and 82%, but it's different by level. Um, and uh, we do expect some fluidity in the next few months. You know, that, that w the way we worded it on the survey was that if you um, are going to come out of, you know, you, you, you are in distance learning, you chose it, but now you want to come back. It's not an immediate back. Like we're, we're going to need at least a couple of weeks to say, do we have room? Do we have to make some staffing adjustments? So, um, you know, we're going to see how that goes, but we expect some fluidity. At the secondary level, where the model is all about streaming into the class anyway, the transition is not nearly as complicated and, and will um, uh, be able to handle anybody who kind of changes their mind on on that um, front. Hey, hey, Neil, just to, how about the other way? How about somebody who's in school, but maybe he's just not feeling comfortable and right. Go distance. Our our hope would be to quickly move them into distance learning. Um, and uh, however, you know, there's a communication time where we got to let the teacher know that you're getting a student. Um, so we. Uh, and some of our distance learning, we're at, in our distance learning group, we are trying to follow class size, normal class sizes. So there might have to be some staffing adjustments in order to add a kid. Most other districts uh, did not um, pursue, but I think when we, you know, assuming the infection rates stay down and we get to the threshold dates of two weeks in and then four weeks in, you know, we, we are really going to be able to have a separate group of distance learners with the, if you are in person there's no buddy streaming in if the people who are in person have their teacher and the distance learning kids have their teacher and other districts even locally have not done that so that um the the plan for those elementary teachers is kind of what we're doing for the first four weeks that aaron described that's how the year will look like you will have maybe six or seven kids in your class all year long who are coming into the class virtually. We uh, were pretty happy with what we did, but it took a commitment. Um, we ended up with 17 virtual learning classrooms. That's two at uh, the kindergarten level, and then um, three each at grade one, grade two, and grade three, and then two each at grade four, five, and six for a total of 17 teachers. In addition to that, we added four classroom teachers in person in order to get those ratios that we talked about of having 18 students or under in person. So all told, it was 21 teachers that, um, or 21 classrooms that were added, 17 virtual classrooms and four in-person classrooms. To not have that I, I mean, I know we're not in budget season, but you all know what 21 teachers would do to the budget. We repurposed um, 17 of our teachers, people who are currently reading interventionists and math coaches and uh, language arts consultants, people who had other roles in our district and said, what we need for this year is you to be in a classroom with a smaller cohort of kids. Some of those uh, people were, uh, repurposed to distance learning. Some of them will be returning to classrooms for the first time in a few years, and they're pretty excited about it. Um, so it, it, is, um, it is a mix of people. That, what it did, I told you, um, we also added four in-person classroom. So the 17 that we redeployed, it is, at the end of the day, it's four new teachers that we're hiring. So um, I literally signed two today. Um, we interviewed some more. I've got more coming in. So we're adding those last four teachers we need um, right at the last second here and getting them into professional development next week. So that the, the budget impact ended up being a, a four teacher impact. So well, it, I'm sorry. Oh, it, it, there's, there's so many new things, obviously. The, the, the hybrid <coughs> really creates a nice transition uh, to, a, to a full you know, in person. Absolutely. 
I, I just want to build on that because going back to what Jen read from the list of 40 parents, right? I mean, I understand that, and I have some of those feelings myself, right? Um, but, but like Todd just said, and Matt spoke about earlier, the goal of the way we're positioning it is the goal of the hybrid is to ease into it with the goal of returning full time. Yes. And, and that's really important. It's not that we're doing this because this is our, how it's going to be forever. <coughs> And it's the goal of little. Th it's the goal of transition in a little way, in the classroom. As I'm a teacher with kindergartners and teaching them, this is when we wash our hands, and this is how we eat lunch, and yeah. so in the classroom. But also the goal of on the first day not having 400 cars pulling up to a school, but maybe having 150 cars pull up to a school, and because the, the, you know our principals are working their tails off to plan things like drop-offs and pickups and recesses and lunch and all those things, and the idea was start get those procedures right and then grow them. So it's 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 small and it's large in terms of the the transition. And what about what those we've repurposed those people, but who's doing the jobs that they were doing? Some of those jobs are going to be. Um, not happening this year. Mm -hmm. We did like make tutors and stuff. Yeah, the tutors are still in place. We did maintain um, one uh, one math coach and one language arts uh, consultant, at, so that the district would still have people working at that curricular level, but more of the direct support that those people uh, offered. It, it's it's not going to be as robust as it's been in the past. So well, hopefully, we've gotten room for teachers to talk to the students. Got smaller cohorts. So hopefully they'll be the, that will be helpful and it won't be as correct. So right. I mean, it, the, the, the balance will be the smaller classrooms and such. I'm just curious, like, how do they, with those 17 teachers, who is like that's almost like another school? Who's the principal? Who's the administrator? Glad who's, you said that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering, like, who's checking in? It's you, Jen. So. <laughs> So Betsy Gonzalez, our director of elementary curriculum, is now going to be the director of our virtual learning program at the okay. elementary level. Okay. Um, she's already um, been in communication with those 17 individuals who are distance learning teachers. Um, and they've started meetings and their professional development just like the others next week they've got a whole schedule of how they're going to get up to speed as a as a distance learning school if you will um just short of four, it, it's it's literally like a 400 student school um and it will be it has specials we've at, we've added a little bit of fte to art music and pe in order to make sure those kids in the virtual learning academy get specials um and uh, they'll also have opportunities to have things, uh, not right away, but the, the plan is to have things like their music lessons in Spanish. And like, we're going we're gonna to try to do it the right way for those kids as well. So, um, so Betsy is hard at work. She's, she's very happy about her new title. Yeah. Yeah. So. The, um, <laughs> but it's going to take, it, with kids, and this is why, I'm just trying to reiterate, this is why it's going to take time to transition, because if you have a bunch of kids that just drop in or a bunch of kids that leave you're going to then have to switch some of those teachers yes. or get new teachers or yeah and that's that fluidity yeah. of yeah okay yeah. which is another reason why the hybrid is a good idea to start with because let's see where things go and shake out a little I, bit i i do want you all to know and and uh the public as well that that the intention with the virtual classrooms that are being set up mm -hmm. If there are, let's say, 10 Latimer kids and 10 Tutin kids who signed up, they're trying to keep the kids from the same school together in their virtual classroom with their teachers. So this is a classroom that's you'll see some friends in your classroom virtually because we're trying to keep the to the greatest extent possible that we could do. But that. if we have to mix them up, we have to mix them up we because to, we, yeah, absolutely. I mean, budgetary, we ought to be aware. Yes. So we got yeah. I mean, we don't want people to expect that. Yeah. We just we're hoping to try to help with that. So um, at the secondary level, I just want to point out, you know, we've talked about the, the, the survey doesn't affect the, the delivery as much, but we do, I, we do want people to know that um, in, in order to uh, 
be able to deliver. We, we have a, a small number of teachers, uh, um, a handful, that will be delivering instruction from home. They, they will be at home while the class is there. We've hired certified teachers as substitutes who are in the room. So there's, a, there's another adult in the room who um, is a is a certified skilled teacher but the you know and because otherwise you would have been in a position trying to find teachers of um you know very um specific courses and 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 these are people who are content experts and need to be delivering that instruction so we've accommodated that small handful of people from home so it's possible that a student it well it will happen some students will have a course where their teacher is at home. We have made sure that and different than the elementary level, your other five or six courses will be delivered as normal, but for that one period of the day, you may have a, a virtual um, teacher uh, buffered by a co-teacher in the classroom. And so, when we go full-time, that could still, that will still remain? That could still remain in remain full-time in instruction, yes. You know how many teachers that is we have um, right now assuming that doesn't change before school opens and yeah. I don't think it should because people have had plenty of time to contact human resources uh, we have one teacher like that at Henry James and four at Simsbury High School mm -hmm. and we have uh, gone through the schedules to do um, so at Henry James it would not have its one teacher um, at Simsbury High School I know Kempera went through schedules to try to make sure no kid had the same that happened twice during the day that that was um, so um, in terms of the transition plan again we, we uh, view it as uh, short term at the elementary school if you if you talk about our orientation day and then Labor Day week it's really eight days of school before we bring K2 back into the fold completely so on Monday September 14th it actually will be in-person school for grades K through two. Like we, we will start, the buses will run on Monday the 14th and the third through sixth graders will still be home on Monday, but K through two will go to school on the, uh, you know, um, some on the bus, many being dropped off by their parents. So uh, th that, and then two weeks later, it's not exactly two weeks later, because again, Yom Kippur is the 28th, so on Tuesday, the 29th, that would be the time when we would bring grades three through six back in person, so that by the time you get to the end of September, your elementary schools are reoccupied on a full-time basis. Is that, uh, is that, as long as we stay under 10 for 100,000? Correct, as, as long as the... Yeah, with her. As long as the health what? data is supporting What's that. that? Yeah. yeah. It was 25, Absolutely. I think. Oh, yeah, what is it? 25. It was 25 for the high, up to the hybrid. No, 10, up 10 to 10. To the, with low. 10. Up to 10 supports in person. Yeah. 10 to 25 supports hybrid. Okay. And above 25 supports distance learning is how that marker works. Okay. So um, that's really a big part of the focus. Well, by the end of September, let's have everybody in in person. That same timeline, as we get to the end of September, we have advertised that our secondary students, um, uh, 7 through 12, will be in the hybrid through at least Columbus Day. But this is when we're going to try to make a decision about what we're doing after Columbus Day so that we can communicate right at the end of the month, like, here's the plan if we can bring back more students. We're hopeful that we're going to be able to bring back more students at that point. And, and be able to announce that. But again, that's monitoring what's happening in, in, um, and, and um, the commissioner's statements on this early, s strongly supported in-person learning for K-8 and um, you know, suggest, and we've known this all along too, high schools are a little harder. High schools are a little more complex in the way students move and the way um, they're just bigger places. Um, so the, the early statements from the, the commissioner were to, for school districts to make every effort to get K-8 back in person um, as much as possible. But we're gonna work, we're working K-12. Well, that's, that's our goal is to, is to get everybody K-12. So, um, and again, as you pointed out, that's depending on the public health markers. So um, that's the transition plan. I'm happy to take any other questions that um, you have about this portion before I turn it over to Sue Lemke. Another question? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you 
question, just a comment. It will be interesting four years from now to see what things we've learned and what what sticks. I mean, you read these articles about just the way businesses run and kind of lessons learned over the last six months. It will be interesting to see what yeah. uh, how things change because of uh, some of the things that we've done now. Yeah. Absolutely. And Neil, I don't know if this is going to come up, but it was another thing is that um, are we providing, or can you say to the public, we're providing tents or things outside at least the junior high and the high school? Yes. So that those kids can do more outside as well. And it's a, it's a big part of the lunch del plan delivery. Um, you know, the, the uh, so tents have been ordered for um, Henry James and for Simsbury High School. It's, it's, a fairly notable expense so we wanted to see so we've brought them in through the first two months of school we've we rented to see how this was going to work and then we'll uh, you know depending on where we are over the winter and into the spring we'll reassess what we're going to do um, I do know that other uh, schools are talking about pitching in to get tents for outdoor spaces no but, pun intended yeah <laughs> yeah there you go thank, <laughs> thank you sorry ah. so and kids will have the flexibility to go outside if they want to. Uh, I think certainly uh, at, uh, at the high school, on the notion of like a free period, yeah, we want you to go outside. <laughs> right. Go sit outside, you know, socially distanced, but outside. Have the Henry James tables been ordered? Uh, yes. Yep. And will the tents be there for when the school starts? Or? That's our delivery. Okay. We were told late August delivery, so we're optimistic. <laughs> so, okay. all right. Thanks, everybody. Thank well, you, Neil. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks for all your hard work. Great. And thank you for taking care of the um, teachers. Hi, everyone. Hello. So um, something that you all know is very near and dear to my heart, um, how do we provide access to the general education experience in an equitable way for all of our students? So I want to share with you some thoughts and comments and steps regarding those two topics tonight. Um, first of all, the equity statement that you very intentionally discussed and adopted, um, we are using that equity statement as a lens from which to make these decisions around access and equity. And actually, um, Aaron did speak about our new teacher orientation and we unveiled the equity statement to them and the overall response was, it is awesome that a district is putting this front and center around um, how we make decisions uh, around equitable experiences and opportunities for our students. So certainly continue to use that document to examine our practices for all. Um, you know, there is a lot that goes into ensuring that students and staff have what they need in order to be successful. And certainly those areas of need are varied among individuals and among populations. But these are some things that we have been certainly focused in on. Um, technology, do students and teachers have what they need in order to access the instruction that is being provided to them? And do teachers have what they need the right tools in order to make that happen. Um, also, the, the concept certainly we heard uh, in our March to June time period, the need for increased live instruction, and certainly I think through Aaron's comments and Neil's regarding that synchronous teaching, that that is certainly a focus of access and equity. Um, certainly I think about uh, our students in district with individualized education plans and 504 plans. And those don't go away, whether we're in hybrid, full person, or in a distance learning model. So working still with teachers and with administrators and to support staff to make sure that students have access to what they need, again, in order to take full advantage of the opportunities provided. Um, meals have certainly been a huge um, aspect of what we've been working on. So at the elementary level, meals will be delivered to classrooms. Certainly we continue to encourage our families to send 
lunches with their children. However, um, our, under the direction of our Director of Nutrition Services, Lori Lascarbo, she along with her cafeteria managers have been doing an outstanding job ensuring that um, we are bringing some technology to even that process. So teachers will have a Google roster and they will take lunch counts. Who's going to need lunch today? Who brought their lunch? Who needs milk? That's going to be sent to the cafeterias and then at certain lunch waves, those lunches will be delivered to the classrooms. Um, for those students who are participating in distance learning, although we anticipate the numbers to be smaller, they too can order lunches and we will have certain pickup times for them to access those meals. Um, and we're doing that all online through online forms. So I'm going to ask for some patience at the very beginning as we try out some of these new procedures. But again, important to make sure that our students are receiving nutrition so they can be at their best to learn. Hey, Sue, can I just say, uh, Please. With, with meals, mm -hmm. uh, um, how about the choice students? They will also have opportunities. And we are making sure that uh, Lori has been great about working with the, um, her counterparts. Uh, they're working out some different structures to ensure that that happens. Um, we've been throughout the whole um, experience in the pandemic and school closure, uh, we've made sure that those um, necessities were delivered and our students in Hartford during this period mm -hmm. of school closure, they also had meal distributions within the Hartford area communities. So we're still making sure that those particulars are addressed um, through both systems. Now, I know you, we were doing it before. I just mm -hmm. wanted to make sure we were kind of carrying that through. Right. Yeah, thank you. So this is a little bit different now because um, you might recall that we had a specific waiver to provide those meals. That waiver is now no longer. Yeah. Yet we make sure that we have access um, for all students to be able to order those meals and to receive uh, nutritious and balanced both breakfast and lunch, actually. Is, is there anywhere that says what percentage of, is there any percentage of choice kids all doing full time, doing full time distance learning? Um, I don't have the percentage. I do know that we are looking very closely at those students who are choosing distance. Yeah and specifically sharing that information with principals um, and with other support staff so we can ensure that they have complete access. Thank you for asking that question. And then uh, certainly connection with an adult. We want to make sure that every student, every student can identify a person. <laughs> We, again, we're excited to have students here for the very first time since Friday, that March 13th. And we want to make sure that we are spending concerted, intentional time developing relationships. I've said to staff over and over again, I want you to treat every hour and every day of in-person with kids like spun gold and taking those times to develop the relationships. And um, you know, in March of last year, we had had the privilege of working with students for seven months. For many teachers and students, these are gonna be new relationships that are gonna need time and effort to develop. Um, but we're making that certainly that commitment uh, for every kid. It, certainly this also comes under the, the elements of social emotional learning. Um, Aaron had mentioned, this is not just for students, we're going to start with adults, specifically in their professional development, to make sure that they're doing okay. And that as individuals, we're taking care of ourselves so we can make sure that we're taking care of kids. Um, and then the second uh, social emotional learning session, specifically in the first week of professional development, will be focused upon what are the best practices for students? What does that look like, both in a distance learning format and in an in-person format. And that just doesn't go away in the first two weeks of PD. So certainly um, I will come back at any point and update the board specifically on those efforts, uh, but we wanted to make sure that that was an inherent part of our access and equity. 
Um, and then finally, uh, my students specifically with identified special needs. Uh, you've heard me say this before, every student is a general education student first, meaning our job in special education is to ensure that our students have access to the curriculum, to the instruction, to the practices that all students have um, in, here in Simsbury. So again, whether that be distance learning, hybrid or in person, we will continue to implement individualized education plans. Certainly those IEPs were written for in-person instruction. So this state has what they call a learning model template uh, that they are requiring all districts to implement across the state of Connecticut. So if a student, for example, um, is in distance learning and that's the opt-in distance learning, then we need to make sure that we have articulated whatever adjustments for that model, how an IEP might look like through that realm of instruction. Okay, so certainly more on that. And then finally, um, there is a very uh, concerted focus in the state plan and in our plan to bring back specialized population students who have more intense learning needs and difficulties. So we certainly are looking at build, balancing their needs to return to in-person instruction with that building capacity. So um, students who receive specialized services, uh, maybe uh, through our Ready, Set, Go program, through our functional academic programs, um, we are articulating a more early return that kind of coincides with that K2 return at the elementary level so that they have the access to the instruction and in-person instruction that they need. Um, again, we always have to balance that with building capacity and we're reaching out to parents individually about those transitions. What I'm really um, excited about relative to that build back to full person is that at our elementary level by September 28th, we are looking at a full 3-6 return and that also brings back a good chunk of our students who receive IEP specialized services. So I'm excited about that as well. Any questions? I'm sorry. Jen. I'm sorry. We Don't apologize. apologize. Okay. With Neil's changes, or not Neil's change, the changes. <laughs> <laughs> not Neil. <laughs> the changes that are happening. <laughs> the changes that Neil's have about staffing. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like, because I'm assuming that we are behind potentially, and correct me if I'm wrong, in kids maybe who were starting an IEP or trying to get um, services, are we able to catch up and did those are those do we have enough staff to catch up and then still address plus take whatever he needs for the distance learning teachers no that's a great question so we had a number of evaluations i think that that's what you're referring to <laughs> students who are being referred for special education services and we actually started a couple of things in-person evaluations over the summer so those that were most pressing we were starting earlier. Um, the state has officially said that that clock that stopped when we were in school closure starts ticking on our first day of school. So we have a 45 day span, Jen, in order to um, complete that testing. We know in each building, we know which students, and we have a plan to address that. You know, certainly I've reached out to um, my families of students with special education needs. Uh, we actually had a SEPTO meeting where I did a, a Q&A and uh, certainly shared with them that it's very important for us, specifically at the beginning, to um, make sure that our staff are working with students. So we're gonna continue virtual PPTs, for example. Um, again, we're getting some of this evaluation done uh, in the summer or maybe after school. So those processes still continue and they have to continue with very specific timelines and deadlines. Yet we're making sure that our adults are with our kids because that's what needs to happen. Great, thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? Good information, thank you. Yeah. Terrific.
I surely can. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this slide just outlines the actual hardware that each grade level um, will be receiving in this one-to-one -one model. So you have it broken down to, you know, certainly our um, Director of Instructional Technology, John C. Latwinick, with her staff and feedback uh, from teachers and feedback from other, others in the field. Um, identified specific technology that are most appropriate. So that's where you see the uh, iPads for the K1 and then the Chromebooks, of course, that come with chargers and cases, uh, grades two through 12. So that just gives you a graphic there yeah. about uh, yeah, that. I think seventh, uh, I didn't say it earlier, but seventh graders will get their new Chromebooks, the one-to-one -one, uh, on that Monday sure. when uh, they go for orientation as will ninth graders. And just as we talk about equity and access, if there are any families, as we found out in the spring, that needed a hotspot, we'll continue to provide that availability to ensure that they have the opportunity to, to log in. Neil, do you want to talk about heroes? So after we announced the hybrid, my department was looking for a new project, so we decided to get into the daycare game. Um, but uh, uh, more realistically, we knew that the hybrid was going to create strain for our employees who have children. And, um, you know, they were expected to come to work, but their students, their children would be not able to access school on certain days of the week. So um, decided to call up uh, our uh, two uh, wonderful women who run the Seed Heroes program. And under there, you can see that HERO stands for Helping Educators Reopen Elementary Schools so that the Simsbury Public Schools is going to provide that option um, for employees. Um, they had the chance uh, over the past week to sign up, tell us what days of the week they might need the service. Um, Kelly and uh, Nikki have taken in those registrations, and we're going to be able to support 15 families that need this service who are em our employees. So we're, we're um, pretty excited about that. Um, we're right now deciding which school or schools we are going to run that program out of. We have a couple of uh, substitute teachers who are going to take this program on for four weeks and be supported. Um, pot potentially, uh, we, we talked about paraprofessionals. I don't want to make the paraprofessionals who might be watching nervous. We were, we're particularly talking about that on the Mondays when other students wouldn't be in schools because, our, not surprisingly, our biggest day of people needing the support is on Mondays. Um, and uh, we have regular education paraprofessionals who would be working those days who might be available. Um, but otherwise, using SEED staff, SEED staff typically works in the morning and afternoon, so they could be available during the day. So um, again, it is... Uh, uh, for our, uh, so the, uh, I can actually update the slide. We first said it was a priority for Simsbury families because different towns around here have different hybrids, but we are going to be able to support any employee who has come forward and needs this service, whether they live in Simsbury or not. So um, we were pretty excited to be able to provide that service for our, our, our uh, staff. And you'll see it is. It is expected to be the duration of the hybrid. That's how. That's a four-week program. Said, yeah. um, so it has a, a beginning and end. And um, if uh, so, so, the especially the folks from other towns, we said, look, we're going to provide this service for four weeks. If your town remains in a hybrid, we may not be able to to serve the serve this anymore. So, assuming that our plan stays in place. Yeah. So. I'll give credit to the name Heroes to Kelly Curtis, okay. which was better than the name I came up with, I will tell you. Neil, I, Neil, I, I, yes, I have a, just a couple questions. I, I know it's, I mean, short duration, but what, what is this? Is this technically daycare? I mean, you, what, what rules do we have to follow? Yeah. Uh, ratios and. So it's, I sh it, so it'll be, it's mostly supporting distance learning. It's mostly say that those, I, I, you know, we're using that term, but you're basically teachers supporting the distance learning that those kids need to do for the day. So because they're going to come to the place that we're operating this and need to log into their Chromebooks and be joining their class. And, you know, what, like Aaron said, 
they're going to need to know the schedule of this kid needs to log in at 9 for math and 11 for – so that's what they'll be doing. They're really supporting the distance learning. But obviously with a day when you're in that setting, there's going to be time for other play-based activity, you know, games and recess and things like that. But the primary purpose of it is to support distance learning for our employees' children. Yeah, no, I, I get that. I guess I'm just thinking from a technical standpoint – you know, it's different from kids being here for school or for seed. Yeah. It's something new. So I'm just thinking from a liability standpoint. It falls under the same arm as seed. Which yeah, it falls under. Does it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because they're school age kids. Yeah. Okay. Well, seed met all those parameters when we created that as a. As a arm of continuing education. Right. As a, as okay. Care, so. These are K through six. Type. These are K through six. Right. And, and if the for whatever reason the hybrid goes longer than the 25th the program would continue assuming uh assuming we can continue to staff it and yeah. there was a need we yeah yeah okay you know and it's a it's a program where again i said low cost daycare so the the employees are paying a fee mm -hmm. to put their uh children into the program we're we're not trying to make money on it it's a break even it's a yeah, break even it's endeavor right. so very good idea All right all right. All right. Thanks. 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 All right, Amy. Now, how much is all of this going to cost us? <laughs> Switch it out. Thanks. All right. So that's really hard to see, but it's <laughs> Exhibit 7 in your packet if you want to take a look at it. Um, and I'll just start by going down um, the three columns. So these are new compared to the last time I presented. So you have your um, fiscal year 20 actual results, and I don't think anything's changed since the last time I presented. We were still in a surplus position as of the end of fiscal year 20 related to our COVID expenditures. And then you'll see that there's two columns after that. We have our fiscal year 21 to date. So these are all of our expenditures that we've actually spent and cut checks for. And then you, the third column is your fiscal year 21 estimated. So these are for additional expenditures that we are know are coming but um, we either have not completed the orders yet or we're still in the planning phases. So like I said, under column one, not much change from, from the last time that we met. Under column two, we're almost $400,000 um, into um, the fiscal year and COVID-related expenditures. If you go down the list, you can see the majority of these mainly relate to um, technology purchases, the purchases of desk shields were a large expenditure, and then also the ventilation study that's taking place. Under um, fiscal year 21 estimated, you'll see that we had additional Chromebook purchases, distance learning, but then the majority of this almost $400,000 in estimated um, is related to the teachers that Neil spoke about earlier. So I think there's five included in that estimate, and I think he said right now we're at four um, that we are gonna be needing. So as you can see, it's a pretty hefty, type, hefty um, price tag associated with COVID. The um, anticipated savings, we will anticipate some savings at the end of fiscal year 20. The um, financial results will be brought to the Board of Finance next month at their meeting, and we'll be asking them to keep those savings so that we can spend it in this year, pretty much because we already have. Um, and then we still have some grant funding that's coming um, for the CARES money. We put in that application. It was actually um, approved this week. So there's about $83,000 related to that. And then um, the remaining funds will have to come from our non-lapsing. So um, the other pot of money that we have is for FEMA. Since we were able to complete our grant, grant application for CARES um, and we were able to receive that approval, we are good now to apply for um, FEMA funds through the federal government. Um, in doing that, we are pretty much going to submit for everything. I've been talking to them on the town side and one week they'll tell me something's covered and then the next week they'll tell me that same thing is not covered. And in the program administrator's exact words, it's like the wild, wild west. So to the day to day things are changing as to what they're gonna cover and what they're not gonna cover. So we'll be able to see how much we get um, back from FEMA after we apply for that reimbursement. Um, and then- Amy, what's the balance in non-lapsing? Three- 385,000. 
Um, oh, and then the last thing I wanted to point out on the fiscal year 21 estimated under the PPE, you'll see that there's nothing there right now. Um, likely we will need additional PPE as the year goes on, but because we bought in bulk at the beginning of the year, we don't know how fast we're going to go through those supplies yet. So as we are able to start the school year and get um, an idea of how fast those products are going, we'll be able to come up with a better estimate of what we'll need throughout the rest of the fiscal year. Uh, any questions? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Sharon has a question too. Go ahead, Sharon. I'm going to put you up to the microphone. Okay, hi. So, and this is really probably more for the benefit of the audience. Um, so, I see that, can you hear me, Matt? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hi. <laughs> hi, Sharon. We can all hear you. Okay, and I can see you. Um, so, this, there's the 60,000 that's there for the ventilation study. Can you talk a little bit about that, Matt? Sure, sure. So, the... When the reopen document came out uh, to districts, a focal point was from Department of Public Health that people should review their current ventilation system. Uh, we made the decision to bring in an engineering firm to do that. Uh, really the focus of the guidelines uh, under the basic premise are to increase fresh air, reduce recirculated air, and reduce blown air. So those are the three main categories. So we're going to be getting recommendations on technical, technical things like um, settings, uh, airflow, what to do um, in those circumstances. We're already making some adjustments there. Uh, what types of filter upgrades uh, would support improvements. Um, and we're waiting on the final pieces of that study. We haven't seen the final study, but Neil myself uh, met with Jason Casey and Andy today and already have some punch list items of in improvement areas that we're looking at, Sharon. But it was uh, the $60,000 was an independent uh, engineering firm to come in and advise us uh, for tweaks that could make the system better and then things we can think about even long term and planning moving forward. Thanks for that. And I guess, you know, I just thought the community should know yep. that we that, you know. Absolutely. Um, yep. I know there's been a lot of interest in that. Thank you. All right. And, and Amy, I wanted you to know that I'm here too. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Amy, just so I. Thanks, Matt. Yep, you got it. J just to make sure I'm, I'm reading right, this right. So the, the, the cost of COVID, so not the net after gro the grants and all of that, I just, just the just the cost, is it the roughly 800000 or the roughly 400000 Uh, So not with any savings, not with any grants? Right, yeah. Not, not, yeah. not so using the lapsing fund. I'm just... If you're not utilizing mm -hmm. the savings, mm -hmm. it's basically the 400000 yep. and 20 and then the 800000 and 21 Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Great, thanks. Anything else? Good? Okay. Thank you, Amy. I just had a few questions, three quick questions that not for Amy, but for probably Aaron. Okay. Um, by the summer in the summer, typically elementary kids get, and I'm pretty sure it's district wide, they get like a letter from their teacher saying, welcome, blah, blah, blah. There's that issue. Obviously, we've never had to do any of that. So there's some anxiety on the part of parents, but also on kids that they don't know who their teacher is yet, all that kind of stuff. And so with that next week, with them coming back, will there be an opportunity at all? Like, will teachers be going out? And, and on the distance learning side, will those the individuals be reaching out? Yes. Or should they expect yes. this one? Classroom placements for elementary will go out on August 26th so that they will know who their teacher is and there will be a welcome video by the teacher that will go out on that Thursday and or Friday okay. um, to just say this is who I am and welcome and to give them some background information to get them together um, so that will be made available and distance learning is going to follow a similar pattern what we do in our schools the distance learning teachers will be doing as well. They will get, that's going to parent email because students don't have their devices and that kind of thing. So those next Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday are going to be going to parent emails. And then um, the picture, um, 
One of the things, Steve, uh, Mr. Matizik also referenced, but I saw it at, I was at the Apple store recently, and with everybody wearing app masks, they have these IDs of pictures of them. Now they are oh. the anim, animoji faces or whatever, what they yeah. think they look like. But do our teachers <laughs> going to have pictures at all, or have we thought or considered that at all, like of themselves without a mask on them? especially at the elementary level. Mm -hmm. So all of our teachers do have um, badges with their picture on them that are updated. So those are always, you know, I happen to be <laughs> using my mask on this, but that's what should hang on a teacher. Those are, um, so those should be in place. Um, that's so a good idea though, to is, have a picture of the kids. Of you. <laughs> no, to um, picture the teacher behind the teacher. Yeah. So yeah. they're on the video. That's a great, excellent idea. Yeah. I was thinking like even you know, the kids eventually could like, you know, I don't know. But have their own faces. Yeah. Have their own faces or yes. have something. Yeah. And then um, the last question, I don't know who it's for, is the device, is a device question. People, I get asked all the time on those devices, can people use their own devices instead of taking a school issued one? So yes and no, and I'm not an expert in technology. Okay. Because what we've done is we're ensuring, like on the iPads for K-1, that they have the proper apps and everything that they will need. And in Chrome, on the Chromebook, making sure that everything is available for them to access. So I don't know the exact answer. I can find that out and get that back. But I think if you have your own device, you probably could use it. Um, but if there's a particular- At the high school, I always thought you could not. I was I was asked and told no. Well, <laughs> the technology is. And there will be other. There's. There, right. 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 I mean, my kids have used their own, but they still took the school's one yes. as well. Yeah. And there will be particular programs for particular courses at the high school where students will need to have those, whether it's an architecture class or yeah, uh, Project right, Lead the Way course yeah. or something like that. They'll have to have that kind of information um, as well. And the other piece too, just for, for you and for the public, um, we will be providing all the necessary educational resources. So there will be pickup times when people, kids will take it home from school or the distance learning kids. I know that uh, Betsy Gonzalez is working on putting a bag together to, you know, these are things that you need, a whiteboard and materials, and the same kind of thing for, for students. So we're going to, which we weren't able to do in the spring, but that's what we're planning to do um, as we enter school. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody, anything else? <clears throat> okay, um, we don't have anything else for public audience, but uh, just repeat what we had uh, said earlier, if uh, anybody joined late, that um, our, our hope is to have a public audience uh, next time uh, we meet and um, we appreciate emails and communication coming from the public uh, if uh, people have uh, things that they want to share with us. So in lieu of public audience, that's uh, always very helpful. So uh, thank you for what you've done so far. Uh, next meeting is uh, Thursday, September 8th. And again, the hope is to have that in the high school with a little more room and some technology to, uh, to get, get more people and to get some public audience there. Uh, there's nothing else. Take a motion to. So moved. A second. All in favor, I think. Aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, good night. <laughs>